But I think I'm addicted to money. And I also think that I have this need to demonstrate my success financially for affirmation from strangers. Look, it is this deep-seated caveman emotion that we have. And let's not pretend that we can just flip a switch and turn that off. You can't. And it's a very natural thing. Morgan, where does this podcast find you? I'm home in Seattle right now. Let's bust right into it. You have a new book out, Same as Ever, A Guide to What Never Changes. In a tweet, you said that uh, psychology of money was about how you, the individual, behaves. Same as ever is about how we, the collective, behave and what we keep doing over and over. Unpack that for us. Well, I think a lot of this came for me as I, I've been a financial writer for my entire career. And I think I became kind of disgruntled and jaded about how bad the industry is at forecasting. Forecasting the next recession, the next bear market, politics, whatever it is, just abysmal forecasting record. And then so from there, you can either do one of two things. You can just be a grump about it and, and be cynical about how bad we are at forecasting. Or you can say, look, we're actually very good at forecasting things except for the changes, <laughs> except for those surprises. But what are the things that we, that, that we do know are never going to change, that we know are going to be part of our future? And let's put all of our emphasis in that. One of the aha moments that really struck me for this there's a really good book called A Great Depression, The Diary. It was a diary written by this uh, lawyer in the 1930s who was just very observant of society, watching what's happening during the Great Depression. And as I was reading it, this post, this diary entry from 1932, I was thinking to myself, if you change the dates on this to 2008, it would fit in perfectly. Everything that happened in 1932 is exactly what happened in, in, in 2008. And then like three pages later, Benjamin Roth, in 1932, he writes, if you change the dates from 1932 to 1894, it fit exactly in. And, in, and 1894 is exactly what happened in 1874. So it's just like these like financial crises, it's the same story over and over and over again for literally centuries. The details kind of change, the characters change, but it's the same behaviors. It's the same greed, fear, uncertainty that happens over and over again. So it's like, okay, rather than trying to assume that anybody can predict the market, which nobody can, let's just put all of our emphasis in how we know people respond to greed and fear and uncertainty, knowing with certainty that that's going to be a part of our economic future, regardless of how the details might change between now and then. So, but the hard part is sometimes we have head fakes around going into a depression and then we look back and say, oh, this was similar to another time, right? What psychology of money, to use your words, do you see right now? And what might that tell us about what might be in store for us? I think what's definitely happened in the last couple of years is obviously there was just two, about two years, two or three years of very easy money. And easy money, fast money is fragile money. Uh, because when people make a ton of money in crypto, they make a ton of money in, in tech stocks, the emotional burden of letting go of that money, spending it or blowing it on some other dumb investment is very low versus like old money. If you've, if you've worked really hard for years or decades to accumulate your money, you're going to be very careful with how you spend it, very careful with how you invest it. And so I think it's just, we're now, and for the last couple of years have been in this phase of money came very quickly, very easily with almost no effort that had to be put into it, no sacrifice put into it. And then so a lot of the financial decisions that come of that are very poor, not just at the individual level, but the institutional investing level. Money in venture capital and private equity was so easy for years that a lot of the investments were made were just were garbage. And so I think that's this is what we're seeing right now. You can almost see too, there's an interesting thing going on in the housing market where interest rates have gone from 3% to 8% mortgage rates. And by and large, prices have not gone down at all. By and large, that's true. That is very likely just like a mark-to-market failure where people are assuming that their house is still worth what it was worth in 2021, but there's just no market. There's no, there's no actual transactions to market to. So you have this like almost wily Coyote moment where very easy money, a lot of bad decisions, but a lot of consequences really haven't been paid so far in terms of the downside of paying that back. That's kind of where it feels like we are right now. So is one of those things denial? The, the housing market, it feels like we're in a standoff. I mean, there's, the housing market is just so strange right now. This, these interest rates where people are locked into their homes, a lack of housing permits. I mean, I think I read that the average American house has gone from 290, 290,000 to 410,000 pre to post COVID. And when interest rates go from three to 7%, it just means young people can't buy a home. So let's start there. What would you advise most people? you know, in their late 20s, early 30s, start thinking about a home, 
How would you advise them to think about money and saving and what else they might want to be considering? One is I would distinguish a home from a good investment. And if you are buying a home because it's right for you and your family and it's a safe neighborhood and it's a great, it it checks all those boxes, awesome, great, good for you. If you're doing it because you have some sense of FOMO that rent is quote unquote throwing your money away and you just want to get on the housing bandwagon, that's the red flag that you want to avoid. The second thing I would put, particularly for young parents, young couples, young families, by and large, you probably have an urge to buy a home because you because you have this caveman sense of like, I need to provide shelter for my family. Very natural, very ingrained in human behavior. You want to take care of your family. That's the core of this. Well, what's one of the worst things that you could actually do for your family and your young kids? It's being financially extended and over leveraged is one of the worst things that you could do. So if your urge is to take care of your family, the worst decision you're ever going to make is to buy a house that you can't afford even though you're buying that house because you want to provide some sense of care for your family. So if I were a young person looking for my first house today, I would look solely through the lens of what is going to be good for my family. Not what is the best financial investment, not what is the FOMO, not what is the comparison to rent. If it was in the neighborhood that was better for my family and the house situation that was better for my family, I would do it, which is what I did when I bought my first house. I would just be very cautious at any sort of FOMO that might be floating around right now. And it's always there. That right there is a human behavior, a, a paternal and maternal feel, the caveman feel, right? That, and I think the National Association of Realtors has done a great job, you know, trying to convince us that we're not a real man or a real woman or real parents or real Americans until we own a home. And I, quite frankly, I think it's bullshit. I think there's there's a lot of instances where you're just the smarter, more responsible thing to do is to rent. But what are some of the other kind of key attributes or um, psych, you know, behaviors, emotions that you see emerging in what is kind of a weird time right now and how, how it's impacting the economy and the way people think about investing and approach their financial life. One of the chapters in my book might be one of my favorites is the idea that risk is what you don't see. Risk is what you're not thinking about. Carl Richards, a financial advisor, has this amazing quote. He says, risk is what is left over when you think you've thought of everything. That's what risk is. So you can, as an individual, as an analyst, as an investor, spend all of your time looking at the risks in front of you, analyzing the risks in front of you. Great, you should do that. But then when you're done with that exercise, the thing that is not on your list is the actual risk that's going to throw you for a loop. So in the last 20 years or so, it's been 9-11, Lehman Brothers, COVID, of course. The common denominator of those is not just that they were big, it's that nobody saw them coming until the moment that they happened. And so I I do think we are, particularly millennials, my generation, is in this weird spot right now where I graduated college in 2008, teeth of the financial crisis. It was very easy during that moment to say, 2008, the financial crisis is bad. This sucks. This is miserable. But this is a one-off event. This doesn't happen all the time. It was easy to tell yourself that. And then after 2020, after COVID made things at least temporarily even worse than they were in 2008, the economy shut down, 25 million Americans lose their jobs, stock market falls 40%. That I think left people with this idea that like, no, maybe this is just how the world works. Every couple of years, the world breaks. And I think because of that, you always have, like there's always been this pessimism porn that exists online of it's so popular to forecast doom and gloom. And if if you are an optimist, you look like you're a detached, aloof moron. Um, and, and I think that's more, it's easier to do that today than it's ever been, just because we've had all these surprises. One of the things I've learned as an investor, I think, is to unlearn what I think I've learned. And what do I mean by that? I find that every time I listen to my emotions, not every time, half the time they're right, half the time they're wrong. My emotions don't know any more than a coin flip. So when Donald Trump was elected president, I thought, oh, we're fucked, and I sold everything. And the market skyrocketed. When COVID broke out, I sold a lot. I'm like, oh, my God, it's a national, it's a global pandemic. And stocks did go down. I'm a genius. And then they ripped up and had some of their best. I have a temptation now, Morgan, to sell everything. I mean, we're due. We're due for a huge correction. And I'm just not going to do it. I'm going to stay diversified and try and ignore the catastrophizing and my own emotions and my own pessimism. What are your thoughts about, I'll start there, ignoring your emotions when it comes to investing, your thoughts? I think any way that you can mechanize your investing strategy 
is the right way to do it. Just to make it mechanical and to just say, this is the strategy and I'm going to do it come hell or high water. My friend Nick Majuli has a great book. The book is titled Just Keep Buying. It's it's kind of a, a you know promoting dollar cost averaging because when you dollar cost average, when you just say I'm going to invest a thousand dollars on the first of every month forever, no matter what the economy is doing, I'm going to do it. You're taking the emotion out out of the equation. You're not saying I'm going to do it when I think GDP growth is going to be above X percent, whatever it is. It's just taking it out to the extent that you can actually pull that off, which is another thing. It's harder to dollar cost average than it is to say you're going to do it, to actually do it in, in time. There's almost no investing strategy, even in with hindsight bias that you can create, that's going to do better than that. I, I've, I've seen these studies where people put together these back tests that you would think would be so logical to say, look, let's back test with hindsight bias and say, we're, gonna, we're only going to invest when the PE ratio is below this amount, when the economy is at the bottom of a recession with hindsight bias. And even still in, the, in those studies, it doesn't beat dollar cost averaging. There's a study that I think is titled, even God cannot outperform dollar cost averaging. And so that's, and, and the crazy thing about it is that it's the easiest thing to do. It takes no effort. It takes no analysis. You don't need to watch CNBC. You don't need to do anything. You just set it and forget it. And so not only is it the easiest, it's the best over time. So it's not to say it's perfect. It's not to say it's infallible, but especially when you adjust it for effort, there's almost nothing else that will beat it. Yeah. It, it, I mean, it's really interesting. I, I, one of the things, another well, a lesson I'd like to think is that, and it's kind of disappointing, is after being exposed to some of the quote unquote brightest minds in the history of investing, my takeaway is that nobody knows. <laughs> and, that's, and that we all like to think that we're tapped into some proprietary resource or or knowledge or that we have a better gut or we listen to someone with a better gut and what i found is at the end of the day nobody knows you said something that really uh, struck me and that was invest in preparedness not in prediction what did you mean by that that's a quote from nasim talib and i i, I love it that 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 i use in the book rather than saying, I'm going to predict the next recession and it's going to occur in, t- in Q4 2024, making that up. A much better way to think about risk is just to say that my asset allocation, the cash and bonds that I have, the flexibility and room for error that I have in my finances would be able to endure a recession whenever it happens. One of the ways to think about it is how does California think about earthquakes? Well, you can't predict earthquakes. You can't say it's going to occur next quarter. It's going to occur ne- at this point next year. There's no earthquake CNBC with people like pundits predicting when it's going to happen. But you know it's going to happen. So when you are building your homes, when you're the EM firefighter, EMS crews are training, they're always prepared for it to occur at any given moment because you intuitively know that you can't predict when it's going to happen. I think thinking about recessions and bear markets in the same way is the best that we can do. So like, there's a difference between a forecast and an expectation. A forecast is saying there's going to be a bear market in February. That's a forecast. An expectation is, historically, the market has declined 20% three times per decade. And I expect that to be the case going forward. And psychologically and financially, I'm prepared for that to occur at any given moment. Because as we've seen with like all of the other 20% declines, they occur when you don't expect them to happen. And as you pointed out, the 20 to 50 to 100% surges occur when you don't expect them to happen. So quit the BS of like of assuming that you know when this is going to happen. And let's just set yourself up, like put yourself in the game so that whatever happens, you're going to benefit from it as long as you can endure and stick around for long enough. Yeah, sort of the basis of scenario planning is not trying to predict the future, but predict a series or a course of action that performs best across a number of scenarios. Isn't, isn't that kind of what you're saying? Yeah. I mean, so much of this is like realizing what bet you're making. Like, what is the bet that you're making when you invest? And I think a lot of people, even professional investors, can't really answer that question. If you stuck it to them, they they wouldn't really have a formalized answer. This is the bet that I'm making. Because they're following an intuitive hunch, like a knee-jerk reaction of, oh, well, GDP is falling, so I think the market's going to fall too. Is it really? That's the bet you're making when you verbalize it like that? It sounds pretty silly, doesn't it? I think the bet that I'm making as a long-term dollar cost average into index fund invest uh, 
kind of investor is similar to what you said. I'm making a bet that over the next 50 years, the economy will become more productive, that the economy will grow. We're going to have more people who are better at solving problems 50 years from now than we do today. And that that benefit is going to accrue to myself as a shareholder. That's the bet that I'm making. And one of the other things that happens when you verbalize the bet that you're making is you realize all the other people who are making different bets are playing a different game than you. And therefore, the information that they're looking at and the punditry that they are speaking about on, on TV, it doesn't apply to you. It's not to say that it's wrong, but it's a different game than you're playing. So once you really like crystallize what you're doing and the bet that you're making, it can do one of two things. You instantly realize once you say it out loud that you really it's a silly bet that you really have no idea what you're doing. And two, it really hones your focus on the kind of information to pay attention to and the people who you should pay attention to as well. Your book, I mean, it's interesting, Maureen. I think of you more as like a life coach and a financial advisor, because whenever I read your stuff, I think you're using finance and investments as a lens to look at how to lead a more rewarding life. Your book is described as a masterclass uh, on living one's best life. How, how can understanding you know, the constants in your life lead to a more successful and fulfilling life beyond just financial comforts? Well, I feel like um, all investing is, is the study of how people behave with money. So let's start there and recognize that it's a behavioral topic. Well, everything else in life is behavioral. Relationships are behavior, your friendships, your career is behavior, politics is behavior. Everything falls under the behavior umbrella. So there actually is a lot that we can learn from other fields that teach us about investing and vice versa. The first chapter of Psychology of Money is called The Greatest Show on Earth because I thought that finance is one of the starkest windows into how people behave in life because there it's like the, the stakes are so high the emotions are so raw there's so much quick feedback in the stock market that you can learn so much about behavior in investing that you can therefore apply to other fields so for one it's just a, a, a giant window into how people behave that you can apply to other things the other is like well what is money money is a tool that you can use to give yourself a better life and the the reality though is that a lot of people use it as a tool to foster some sort of addiction, to climb the social ladder, to give other people a scorecard for which to measure themselves by. Like there's a lot of different things that you can do with money, some of which are great, others can be disastrous. So I, I think all of these fall under some sort of generalized life advice because what else are we trying to get rich for if it's not to lead a better life? But you just said something that I think is really interesting and that is your approach to money probably somewhat indicates your approach to other relationships. I mean, as someone who's taking outsized risk financially, do you find that that carries over that they take outsized risks or, or poor, you know, they're too risk aggressive with their relationships or their approach to their own health? Or do you think that sometimes people bifurcate their behaviors when it comes to the relationship with money versus their relationships with, with other parts of their lives? I think what, what, maps here. And what's definitely true is that what everybody wants out of life is respect and admiration, particularly from the small subset of people who they want to love them, their friends, their, their close friends and their family. And there's many ways that you can gain respect and admiration. You can do it through your wisdom and your love and your humor and your friendship and your ability to listen and your empathy. Or one other way to do it is by showing off your car and showing off your house and showing off how wealthy and successful you are. By and large, if you can gain your respect and admiration through the former and the small subset of people who you want to love you, love you because you are smart and wise and funny and empathetic and et cetera, then most people will seek it there. If you cannot get your respect and admiration from there, then it's very easy to default to saying, I want to be rich and have a Ferrari and have a huge house so people will look at me and say, that guy's great, that guy's cool. I think that tends to be, not for everybody, but that tends to be what, what happens here. So I think there are a lot of people who have a very strong desire to become rich so that they can have a lot of big, fancy, flashy toys because deep down, they think that that is their ticket to get respect and admiration from other people. But I think it's it's just a much more uh, lasting and enduring way to seek your respect and admiration from the people who you want to love you through things that by and large have nothing to do with money. It's interesting. I, I think I'm, uh, just so you know, Morgan, these podcasts are just an excuse for me to talk about me. Um, but I think I'm addicted to money. And I also think that I have this need to sometimes demonstrate my success financially for affirmation from strangers. 
And I think a lot of it is so deep rooted as an instinct when you want other men to respect you, uh, you want women to be attracted to you. These things are really deep rooted. And in addition, when you're in America, as a man, I believe you're largely evaluated your worth, the amount that you, of respect you deserve, the amount of love you deserve is largely correlated in a capitalist society, specifically in America, with how much money you make as a man. I mean, I just think it's so hardwired into us. One, and I think some of that is probably good, but it's trying to figure out when and where you should modulate it. What are your thoughts? I think we can respect both ends of the spectrum here and say, look, it is this deep-seated caveman emotion that we have. And let's not pretend that we can just turn that, like flip a switch and turn that off. You can't. Because you have it, I have it. Everyone, I think virtually everyone has that deep-seated desire to show off how successful they are. And it's a very natural thing. But I think if you if you acknowledge that and recognize the game and how it's being played, then you can also, you can still chase that and still realize that actually what you want is respect and admiration. And what you're going to gain it from is not by showing off your car, even if you're still doing that. What you're actually going to gain it from uh, are things like, do you have a, a loving and caring spouse? Do your kids respect and admire you? Are your kids well-balanced and happy themselves? That's what's actually going to make you happy. The, the place I would maybe push back a little bit is that I think it is hard to maintain healthy relationships if you don't attain, as a man, a certain level of financial security, which is getting harder and harder in this economy, that distinct of what we would like to believe, that when a woman starts, a woman in the relationship, in a heteronormative relationship, and I'm not saying this applies to every relationship, but that when the woman starts making more money than the man, the data shows, unfortunately, the likelihood of divorce goes way up. And that regardless of how many subscriptions to the Atlantic or the New York Times or how evolved we'd like to think we are, that men are still, their attractiveness to their spouse is unfortunately and disproportionately predicated on their ability to be a good provider. And that while I get that we should focus on the love and the relationships, without a certain level of financial security as provided by you, the man, and I realize this sounds sexist, but I think there's data to show this, it's going to be difficult to maintain those relationships. What are your thoughts? I think you're right. I don't know if I have much pushback. I, I would I would distinguish between financial security for your family and being rich. Those are very two, however you want to define rich. I have I have a good friend of mine who makes maybe 50 grand per year. And he has, he has two kids. He's married a great relationship, but he's, he's, uh, he's self-conscious about the money that he makes because some of his friends make considerably more. And I told him one time, I said, look, you are a great dad. You're a great husband. You work hard. You provide three solid meals for your kids. You're going to help your kids out with college someday. By that alone, you have already achieved 90% of the respect that I'm capable of giving you. And maybe if you are a very successful entrepreneur and you did this creative thing, that respect would go from 90% to 95% or something like that. But I think that's really true. And you can flip that around and say someone who's providing enormous financial security, who is very rich and wealthy, but they're not there for their kids. They're on their fifth divorce, whatever it might be. I wrote about this last week. Among the 10 richest men in the world, there are a cumulative 13 divorces. And so that's, you know, I, I think for most people, if you said, would you rather make $100,000 a year, which for, for in most places you can provide financial stability for your family. And in that situation, let's assume you have a spouse who loves you, well-balanced kids who admire you, good health, good friends, eight hours of sleep, or you can make a million dollars a year and have none of those things. Uh, none of those things. It's, it's obvious which 95% of people should pick in that scenario, but we still have the caveman instinct to push for it as, as, as much as we can. I know wealthy people. I know you do too. And on average, they are not any happier than people who are just oh, just doing okay. They're happier than people who are poor, but are they happier than people who are, are people who make $10 million a year happier than people who make $100,000 a year? On average, absolutely not. And I think it, if anything, it leans the other way. The people who are crazy financially successful got that success because they work 100 hours a week. And because of that, they don't have good relationships with their spouse or their kids. They're not well adjusted. They have They sleep four hours a night, et cetera, et cetera. But I want to think that I, that's kind of my North Star is like, 
I want to be very financially successful. I want to be more financially successful than I am now. But none of that is going to mean a damn unless I'm spending adequate time with my kids and my wife and my health and my own sleep and my own sanity. I'd like to think you're right, but my gut is saying the reality is in today's economy, happiness is becoming more correlated with wealth and how much money you have. You you talk about the relationship between happiness and expectations. I like that part of your writing. Talk more about that. Well, it's just this idea, and this very this is a great seg- segue to what you just said. I don't disagree at all with what you just said. And I think to, to summarize my point here, I can easily imagine a world in which my grandkids earn, adjusted for inflation, double what we earn today, and they're no happier for it. And they're, the medical technology that they have is exponentially better than you and I have today, and they're no happier for it. And all of these things. And I think that has been the common path of history. That's one of the chapters of Same as Ever, is, is about expectations and reality, where there's no such thing as an, ob- an objective measure of wealth. The average middle class, median American today, lives a life that is way better materialistically way better than the average rich person did in the 1950s. I I always say John D. Rockefeller never had penicillin, Advil, sunscreen, go on down the list. Most of John D. Rockefeller's life, sunglasses had not even been invented yet. And so the average American has access to these things that the wealthiest people could not even fathom. But you cannot say that the average American should be happier or feel like they're living better than Rockefeller because everybody just looks at their neighbors and their coworkers and measures themselves relative to them. It's always a relative value. And social media just like dumps gasoline on this fire because it used to be, and when I say used to be, I mean like five or 10 years ago that you compared yourself to your neighbors and your coworkers. Now you're comparing yourself to an ag- algorithmic yeah, curated to the list of, yeah. <laughs> of people. Yeah. Someone, someone phrases, I, I, I forget who I need to give credit to here, but it's so brilliant. They said, we went from keeping up with the Joneses to keeping up with the Kardashians. That's exactly what it was. We've always been keeping up with the Joneses, but now it's this fake highlight reel. And everybody knows, every single person knows the person whose Instagram feed, the close friend whose Instagram feed looks like butterflies and rainbows. Here's how happy my family is. But if you actually know that person, you know their life is a disaster and they're depressed, they're on the verge of divorce, etc. And so even the, like the, the highlight reel that you're seeing is so fake. And that, I, I, I don't think we understand the consequences of what that's going to be. I, I, I can already see it in my own kids. My, my son is eight and watches a fair amount of YouTube, watches Mr. Beast, which I think is like wholesome stuff. But because of that, when I was growing up in the nineties, my definition of a rich person was the people who bought new pickup trucks. And a normal person was a person who drove a used pickup truck. And now my son's definition of a rich person is a private Island and a golf stream and seven Lamborghinis and Mr. Beast who gives his friends a million dollars. Cause it's funny. That's his definition of like, I wouldn't even say successful. That's his definition of like status quo. It's so hyperinflated from what even his parents had. So what is that going to do when the generation who's eight years old right now and is growing up with YouTube, growing up with Mr. Beast, becomes 30 years old and they need to buy their first house and have their first career and they start having kids of their own? I don't think we know what it is, but you can piece together that it's probably not going to be pretty. It's not a situation that's going to lead to a lot of happiness around society. We'll be right back. Have you thought about the way that the way you're raised impacts your relationship with money as you get older? There's a quote that I love from Josh Wolf where he says, chips on shoulders, put chips in pockets of like, if you grew up poor, you're going to be more driven. Statistically though, the opposite is true. There's this like jaw dropping research from, from this economist named Bakshar Mazunder, who says, uh, who has shown that income among brothers is more correlated than height or weight among brothers. So literally if your brother is rich and tall, you are more likely to also be rich than you are tall. That's what his research has shown. Like so much of like, yeah, like the quote, like the, the only way that you can predict with any sort of accuracy, anybody's income, the most, like what it correlates the most is, is your father's income. And so once you look at those statistics of just economic mobility, it's lower today than it's been in a very long time. It used to be substantially higher, like your ability to be born poor and then become rich. By and large, though, statistically, you're going to, you're, you're, you're probably not going to venture that far. Of course, there are many exceptions, but on average, that tends to be how, how it is. I saw this, uh, this chart yesterday that showed the percentage of people 
who get a very high SAT score based off of the decile of their parents' income. And it's exactly what you would think. If your parents are poor, the odds you're going to have a good SAT score are very low. If your parents are billionaires, there's like a 30% chance you're going to be in the top 5% of SAT scores because you can afford the best tutors and whatnot. So that just like getting locked into your social economic group is huge. And to deny that and ignore that, I think, is, is a problem. To say that, you know, anybody can make it to the top is just statistically not true. It's just so much harder to do than if you grew up. I, I honestly think the sweet spot is growing up in a middle-class family. Like you have enough money to give you some opportunities. You're going to go to a decent public school. Like maybe you can afford a cheap SAT student, uh, tutor, but it's not so much money that it's going to ruin your driving ambition. And Buffett has this quote. I don't know if he's actually pulled this off with his kids. He says, give your kids enough money so that they can do anything, but not so much money that they can do nothing. And I think like that's, that's the sweet spot. I'd say a lot that if I had what my kids have, I wouldn't have what I have. And so that sets up my question to you. You have kids. And this is, there's so many blessings that come with having some professional and financial traction. On the whole, you take it all day long. But one of the issues you face as a parent, if you have some financial success, is how do I instill the characteristics that not only made me financially secure, but the money is great. But what is really rewarding is that I earned it and I have it and I accomplished it and I built it with someone, a partner that loves me and I love, and we built something together. Have you thought about how you're going to instill that level of grit such that your kids have that grit? I mean, we all, we all think we're going to, oh, well, you know, I'm going to cut my kids off. All of my friends say that. None of them do it. 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 I, I think a lot about this. My, my daughter is four. And in theory, my wife and I want to raise kids who are not spoiled. Of course. Of course, that's what we want to do. But my four-year-old daughter, I think she already knows if she flutters her eyes and pouts her lips, I'll buy her anything 100%. she wants. And so, and so if, if it's like that at four, what is it going to be like when she's 16? In theory, I don't know if I can actually pull this off. My kids are four and eight. But I would like to think that I could be a safety net, but not a fuel in terms of, look, because of the money that your, your parents have made, we're never going to let you fall flat on your face. You're obviously never going to be homeless. You'll yeah, always a backstop, have backstop, but not a hammock. You'll always yeah. have a backstop, yeah. but not a hammock where you're going to get the best education money can buy, but under no circumstances are we just going to give you an allowance when you're an adult? Absolutely not. Not in a million years. And I, I hope we'll be able to pull that off. And I hope it therefore benefits them that they have this. And I, I think that because I think my parents actually did that for myself and my siblings. We always knew that if we got into trouble when we were 22, they'd be there for us. And from the time I was 16, it was like, if you want to do anything other than eat a basic diet, you need to go work. And all, I worked full time all throughout college because I had to. But I always knew that they were there for me if anything happened. And that was that was a big thing. That was huge. Because I think if I did not have that, I would not have taken some of the risks that I did in my career. If I, if that wasn't there, I might have said, I, I need the stable corporate job. I can't go out and take a risk and try to become a writer. Um, so I think having that there was great. And I, that, that's what I aspire to pass on to my kids. Morgan Housel is a partner of the Collaborative Fund, a network of fund managers investing across asset classes. His book, The Psychology of Money, has sold over 2 million copies and has been translated into 52 languages. His latest book, Same as Ever, A Guide to What Never Changes, is out now. He joins us from his home in Seattle. Morgan, I think your books should be required reading in high school because in a capitalist society where money has a, a an unfortunate, unfair correlation to your your well-being, you should be a component of health class in high school. I think you have such a pragmatic, healthy approach, an emotionally balanced approach to um, financial security and ultimately uh, well-being. I think you're doing great work, my brother. Keep it up. Thanks, Scott. I, I so appreciate it. As someone who, who has admired you from afar for many, many years, that, that, that means a lot coming from you. Thank you. Thank you.